We have a great relationship. Angela and uh, Emmanuel and Justin. I would say the relationship is a 10. And I don't blame them. I blame, as I said, I blame our past leaders for allowing this to happen. There was no reason this should happen. There's no reason that we should have big trade deficits with virtually every country in the world. Well, of course, that's Donald Trump discussing relations with world leaders during his closing remarks at the G7 summit in Charlevoix, Quebec. Now, despite the positive talk, Trump went on to say that other countries would be making a mistake if they put up trade barriers in retaliation for U.S. tariffs. Trump has already left the summit early for Singapore. He will meet with Kim Jong-un, the North Korean leader, next week. Trump obviously finished with the G7, but the meeting does continue. What has been Trump's impact on these talks? Well, I would have to say it's been disruptive, negative, uh, flat out alarming actually for, for Canada and probably for some of the other countries involved. It's been everything that they would have hoped uh, perhaps would not have happened. It, it seemed that things were going somewhat better. We saw the uh, sort of the warm tone, uh, a somewhat mocking tone at times, it seemed, from President Trump during the, uh, the session, the bilat yesterday. Uh, but today he came out all guns blazing in his morning news conference, an unscheduled news conference, and showed pretty clearly that he has not been receptive to any of the other leaders' messages on trade, uh, doubled down on his Russia comments. Uh, and I think that perhaps the trade part of it would be uh, the most alarming, perhaps, to the other, the other members of the G7. Uh, let's just listen to how Donald Trump described the U.S. trading relations with the rest of the world. It's going to change. I mean, it's not a question of, I hope it changes. It's going to change 100 percent. And tariffs are going to come way down because we, people cannot continue to do that. We're like the piggy bank that everybody's robbing, and that ends. So there you go, a, a really belligerent tone talking about other countries robbing the United States to the tune of $810 billion in 2017. Uh, Donald Trump showed once again, Andrew, he does not understand economics. He does not understand trade. He interprets uh, trade deficits as an act of theft from the United States Treasury, essentially, or so it seems to interpret his comments uh, well, the way that he put them. And so uh, the efforts to make a sort of a fact-based argument to try to show Donald Trump how this could affect American workers negatively, as well as the relationships with other countries, uh, just seem to have fallen flat. And no one has been able to sit Donald Trump down in a chair and give him a lesson in economics 101. That, it seems, is not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So uh, a broadside, as you say, but he also seemed to take particular aim at Canada. Tell us about what he had to say yep. there. Well, I think the thing that would be particularly alarming to the Canadian government is that uh, he seems to have a, now a fixed idea in his head that Canada's dairy supply management system is the best example he can come up with, and he's come up with it repeatedly when he talks about unfair trade practices to the United States. And his, his language around that uh, was about as confrontational as it could have been, stating that that's going to come to an end and, and that Canada really has no say in the matter. Let's watch him talking about that. The will... Uh either leave it the way it is as a threesome deal with Canada, with the United States and Mexico, and change it very substantially. We're talking about very big changes. Or we're going to make a deal directly with Canada, directly with Mexico. Both of those things could happen. If a deal isn't made, that would be a very bad thing for Canada, and it would be a very bad thing for Mexico. For the United States, frankly, it would be a good thing but I'm not looking to do that. I'm not looking to play that game. So he referenced the 270 percent tariffs on uh, some dairy products uh, repeatedly. And uh, he said that Canada is going to have to change that, that Canada, if it wants to maintain any trading relations with the United States, will have no choice uh, but to give up those tariffs. And his comments seemed really to pit the Canadian dairy industry against every other part of the Canadian economy, making it very clear that uh, Canada is not going to make any headway with Donald Trump until it removes that one thing that now features so prominently in his thinking. Uh, he also talked about the sunset clause in NAFTA, saying that the two sides were pretty close, uh, while at the same time insisting that there will be a five-year sunset clause. And it, it is not accurate, of course, to describe the sides as being very close since Canada and Mexico have both said that that's a red line, a non-starter for them. Uh, you know, he did also have some less 
undiplomatic words. He said that the relationship is very good. He called it a 10 out of 10, but I think you'd be hard pressed to find any Canadian officials listening to what Donald Trump had to say this morning who would describe it that way. Well, while world leaders discuss global trade and other issues at the G7 summit in Charlevoix, activists are on the streets a couple of hours away in Quebec City. Now, they have planned a full day of protests that include a march in the historic Old Quarter. At an event intended to raise awareness of climate change this morning, activists donned huge heads made of fiberglass, each one depicting one of the world leaders at the summit. The protests are taking place 120 kilometers away from Charlevoix, the site of the two-day G7 meeting. Well, our Salima Shivji is in Quebec City. She's been following events for us. So, Salima, tell us what you've seen so far today. Well, uh Michael, this is one of the protests that has been going on for the last hour or so. These are Rwandans, actually, who want their message out there. They're displeased uh, that the president of Rwanda, Paul Kagame, was invited by our Canada's prime minister to take part in some of the meetings surrounding the G7 summit. So just one of the groups that's trying to get their voices heard um, to get their message out there uh, during the G7 summit. There was another one, as you mentioned, just a couple of minutes ago. Uh, the Oxfam actually held a, a little stunt in the morning to bring attention to climate change. They uh, dressed up as the G7 leaders and they uh, stage a little camping site, uh, having the leaders fish and uh basically with their backs turned towards the globe that was burning to show that the leaders are perhaps ignoring the issue of climate change. So lots of little tiny protests uh, popping around as the heavy police presence is felt in Quebec City and has been felt for the last few days. Uh, you know, yesterday was a promised day of disruption where we saw a lot of riot police take to the streets following protesters who had not provided their itinerary uh, during their demonstrations. Uh, those uh, protests were stamped down really quite quickly. Seven arrests in total over the day yesterday. So a lot of uh, heavy security as these protests continue throughout the day. So as you say, a lot of uh, protests, but what can we expect in the hours ahead then, Salima? Well, you mentioned, Michael, the big demonstration, the big march that is taking place uh, this afternoon at 3 o'clock. I actually am joined by Claude Vianco. He's one of the organizers of that protest. So, Claude, I just want to ask you, what is the message of the march that is going to be taking place uh, through the streets of Quebec? Okay, the main message is about social inequalities. We think that since its creation, uh, the G7 have done nothing about this. Even the inequality has increased one year after another. So that's our main message. And we want to say also that uh, the G7 should uh, stop meeting. Anyway, it's too expensive and it's not efficient. Thank you so much, Claude. So that is the message that will be on the streets of Old Quebec, leaving from the National Assembly, heading towards the Old Town, towards the U.S. Consulate, and then back up again as uh, the protests continue and the police will have that under watch as well. Well, this year's G7 summit, of course, is not the top event on Donald Trump's agenda, as evidenced by the fact that he's leaving the summit early. In fact, the historic meeting with the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un is just three days away. And for a look at how the week of diplomacy is being cast in D.C., we did speak earlier today to Lindsay Duncombe. Certainly did dominate uh, much of the discussion in terms of how Donald Trump is reshaping the United States and its place in the world order and stepping away, it appears, from organizations such as the G7, given the rifts that were widely uh, reported between traditional allies. You know, headlines on CNN and Fox uh, Summit showdown. And when Donald Trump gave his news conference today, I think you saw a bit of a backlash to all of that reporting. He took a question from CNN, called him fake news, and went to great lengths to describe his relationships with his allies in a positive light, saying that when it comes to Angela, Emmanuel, and Justin, the relationship was a 10 out of 10. And that's a recharacterization from a lot of the language by Donald Trump going into this summit, and perhaps a sense that he was critical or that that criticism of his relations with those countries uh, was registering with him. But the way that the news works in this country and the discussions work in this country now is that that focus between the G7 is shifting. And, and much of the discussion, as you mentioned, is now is shifting to the summit with Kim Jong-un in North Korea. Well, that said, we are, we are keeping an eye on right now at CFB Bagotville because that is where the U.S. president will depart for Singapore uh, to take part in that summit. I'm wondering, though, in 
in all that we heard from Donald Trump over these last 24 hours, is there any more indication today from, from the U.S. president about the strategy that he's going to pursue once he's in Singapore? Well, he gave us a few more details than he had before. Uh, very much, this is a sense that Donald Trump is going in here to this uh, critical summit, operating from his gut, and that he has great confidence that that is the best way to reach some kind of peace deal with incredibly high stakes with Korean uh, North Korean dictator Kim Jong Un. In that news conference, he said that he would expect it to have a sense of whether or not a deal was possible within the first minute of sitting down with Kim Jong-un. That is just his style. And as Donald Trump looks forward to this summit, you do get a sense that he knows uh, the stakes that are at play here for both the United States and North Korea. Here's more from Donald Trump. It's unknown territory in the truest sense, uh, but I really feel confident. I feel that Kim Jong-un wants to do something great for his people, and he has that opportunity. And he won't have that opportunity again. It's never going to be there again. So I really believe that he's going to do something very positive for his people, for himself, his family. And the other thing that's been happening over the past couple of days or week as we go into this summit, uh, Michael, is that there is a changing of expectations. That was clear from Donald Trump. He was asked, you know, what would be a successful first step? And Donald Trump's answer was it would be to have a good relationship. Really, a sense from the United States that whatever happens with this summit, which is largely going to be a sort of spectacle in terms of these two leaders meeting, is about starting a relationship. So the idea that the United States is going to get the North Koreans to give up all their nuclear weapons on the spot right then and there is something that they are backing away from. And I think a lot of experts believe that what success could be in the North Korean summit is more along the lines of a framework, a timeline. What happens next? Who's going to talk to who behind the scenes? And much of that work will happen not with Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump in a room, but with the people behind the scenes and laying out the next steps. Well, for more on Trump's departure, we're now reaching out to Lloyd Axworthy in Winnipeg. He is a former Minister of Foreign Affairs in the Kretchen government. Mr. Axworthy, nice to see you again. Uh, you know, I, I want to begin our discussion here with a, one more look at what we saw at CFB Bagotville in the last hour. Now, this is the U.S. President departing Quebec, departing the summit, the G7 summit in Charlevoix, the last to arrive, the first to leave. What does this say to you about the priority that Mr. Trump has given to the Group of Seven? I think it just demonstrates the disdain he has for any uh, forum or place in which cooperation and collaboration uh, and rules are required. I think he, this was a kind of a cameo appearance. His statement at the end was almost Orwellian. It just sort of put all kinds of uh, transgressions and uh, sort of retributions on people. Uh, he was saying uh, relationships are number 10, but if you don't do, do it my way, you're going to get hit. We're going to even increase tariffs. I mean, it, uh, it, sometimes it's, it's hard to decipher uh, really what is motivating President Trump, other than he's just a destructive person. Well, I mean, I think he's out to destroy. Let me jump in there. Idea. Let me jump in there, though, Mr. Axworthy, because, you know, we yeah. have seen the U.S. and other countries uh, of the G7 offside on other issues in the past. Uh, in mind, George W. Bush with the invasion of Iraq, the issue of uh, sure. ICBM missiles with, uh, with President Reagan. Is what we are hearing from Trump different than the essentially countries being offside as they were in the past? I think uh, having differences and being offside is part of the whole reason for having G7 meetings and uh, G20 meetings and UN Security Council meetings. But if you have one of the players in that particular circle that doesn't play by any of the rules, it doesn't say uh, we're going to disagree, or, uh, but still accept uh, the fundamental sort of commitments and the values of a uh, global cooperative system, then uh, what do you do? I mean, uh, it, it, he, he is joining a uh, increasing number of world leaders, uh, Putin in Russia, the president of China, who are basically saying we don't have to play by rules, we don't have to have uh, 
uh, basic rights recognized. We're going to do it purely for our own self-interest. And I th don't think you can run uh, any kind of uh, organization if one person is out there to undermine the, the premise or the foundations on what it's built. Well, it's interesting you mentioned Russia amongst the countries because yeah, Trump right. did make some comments about Russia before yeah. he departed for Singapore. Uh, for those who haven't heard it, let's take a listen. Obama can say all he wants, but he allowed Russia to take Crimea. But with that being said, it's been done a long time. I would rather see Russia in the G8 as opposed to the G7. I would say that the G8 is a more meaningful group than the G7. So what's your take on that? Donald Trump essentially saying the annexation of Crimea by Russian uh, military forces is an issue of the past and that the G7 would be made better if it became the G8 once again with Russia. Yeah, but let's go back to the statement. I, I mean, he uh, puts the onus of responsibility for Crimea on his uh, predecessor, President Obama. He didn't have anything to say about the fact that Russia initiated an invasion of another country. Uh, and, and, and that is simply part of the way in which uh, they are playing uh, as a rogue state in many cases. Uh, of course, we've seen that from the day one as his presidency. Uh, you know, he can hardly sort of uh, stop from blaming allies blaming his predecessors, blaming the people who are, have worked over years to build effective systems, but he likes to ally himself with the Saudis and the Russians and, and others who are authoritarian or autocratic. And I think that gives you a real insight. However, let me just say this, Michael. I think he's doing us a favor in a way. It's a wake-up call that maybe we have to take into account that we can all, can't always count on having the United States uh, as a positive, constructive player in the international system. We have to begin to redesign and reset some of the institutions like the G7. And so rather than inviting Russia, which is uh, purely out to destroy the system, why don't we are <laughs> talking about, uh, let's say, having the African Union. If the Euro European Union can be at the G7, why not the African Union? Why not some of the key countries like India, which are democracies? We don't always agree with them, but they do have elected systems. Well, let you know, me jump uh, in there, Mr. Axworthy, because we're yeah. quickly losing time here. But can sure. we afford to do that, though? Yeah, there has been talk about this summit essentially being a G6 plus one. You yeah. say it creates opportunities, but beyond the G7, Canada and the U.S. very much integrated on trade issues, on security issues. Sure. Is that really a position that Canada can afford to take? Well, I, in a way, we've already taken it. When it came to the climate agreements and uh, the Americans withdrew, we simply set up a, a, a negotiation diplomacy to work with other countries, to work with other to, uh, cities and other uh, NGOs and private sector. So I think what we have to do is really think a little bit how this global system is working. And we're not talking about sort of closing the gates and the border. And as uh, the, the foreign minister Friedland said at the opening, uh, we have Quickly incredibly good really. relations, and uh, we have to work in the United States on the on the big on the assumption there's a lot of people there who don't agree with President Trump.